It's easy to miss, but beneath that quarter acre swarm of moths, that's Gautier Bidinta, the diamondback moth. They usually live further down river. Is a quarter acre sunflower orchard, and beneath that sunflower orchard there are two small lots with small houses, positioned so that they are about butt right to each other. The houses are empty now of human life. There's no sign of a person or anything living except for moths and overgrowth. There are some pipes bolted into the cave wall near the perimeter, and a few stone scars where other pipes have been ripped away by scavengers. These once supported the large grow lamps that feed the sunflowers. The lamps are gone now. Once this crop of sunflowers is picked away, it's unlikely anything else will grow there but lichen, moss, and rock formation. The diamondback moth will move on. The houses will be visible again, at least until somebody strips them for building materials or the river washes them away. The houses were once inhabited by two sisters. Why they built the houses so close together or lived in any proximity at all is a mystery, since they clearly despise one another. Some think they were tricked into buying the houses. Maybe by an unscrupulous real estate agent, or more likely a concerned family member. It stands to reason this sorrel rift would have sent ripples of discomfort through the rest of the family pool. Anytime these sisters were in the same room, the tension was incendiary, or so I hear. All that energy had to go somewhere, and both sisters had the same idea. They took up gardening. They both cultivated sunflowers. An improbable crop for this location. Too improbable to be coincidence. Maybe the sunflower had some special meaning for them. Or maybe when one sister saw her rival sowing the impossible seeds, she knew at once she couldn't bear to be outdone. Which sister had the greener thumb? We'll never know. The stalks tangled, the roots knotted, and the seeds mixed. Those gangly sunflowers merged the two lots into one on a different field. The two sisters moved out. Probably around the same time moth started showing up. Of course there was no selling the lots then. Overgrown and bug chewed as they are. In fact, if those sisters ever tried to sell, they'd be in for a rude shock. Not long ago, a property tax clerk, having seen the two adjointed lots registered to the same last name, presumed they belonged to the same owner and erased the legal border between them. What an odd thing to do. Um, Valkyrie and Homer lounge below deck. Hey, I actually get to spend some time with these guys. That's awesome. Please tell me they have a conversation. Oh, wow. It literally was branching. I didn't get to see what they did. While those two gentle beasts kept things under control aboard the Mucky Mammoth, I went ashore with the rest of the crew to make use of a public telephone. I called into my answering machine, which I routinely neglect for interviews of months, to chip away at the pipe. Kate checked in on a client of hers. She's a birth doula, in addition to being a tugboat captain. Did you know that? Clara talked to her sister in Lithuania. Illness in the family, I gather. Anyway, the evening hit a low point, not much later on. So let's take a quiet moment here to listen to the river and reflect on the unburdened sleep of dogs. Uh... 
As we're taught as a card game. And who is us? Clara draws a card. Three deep breaths, eight white doves, five slow hours. She draws another card. Seven blue petals, three deep breaths, eight white doves, five slow hours. What are we listening to? Oh, uh, just this tape a friend of mine sent me. They live in the desert. Mexico, something like that? Sounds good on the Mammoth's PA. Yeah, that's the only way I listen to anything lately. <laughs> Your turn, buddy. Ezra draws the card. Oh, look at this, I get to pick the winning hand. Nine grey feathers, seven blue petals, three deep breaths, eight white doves, and five slow hours. There are three, no, nine grey feathers. Stay focused. Oh, I've, yeah, I've got it. Uh, seven blue petals. Uh, five. Oh, no, it was nine, seven, three. This game is more difficult than it sounds, my friend. You still did pretty good. And we're only how many cards in now? Five or something? I assume it will go to 52. Goes until everyone forgets the card. I could go on a long time then. Well, not with this crowd, I guess. <laughs> We're all too soggy brained. I know I am. I even take homemade supplements for it. Shade green like and boiled with a peel of a lemon, and then frozen and crushed with oak leaves. It's a sculpt massage all. You can uh, smell it if I get close. It dries the brain out a bit. It's helpful for a good memory, if I can remember to use it often enough in the first place. Oh, don't worry, the soggy brain has its benefits too. If your brain is soft and damp, new ideas can make a clear impression, like a boot in a wet sand. But, like wet sand, it can easily get muddied and washed away. So there's a trade-off, see? It's a shame we can't have it both ways, isn't it? What's this game called, Ezra? We're getting game. Okay, so we're just going for a series of little tales here on our journey to God knows where. Kate likes to give her passengers the opportunities to make some floating around money, and that lab pays cash in small envelopes upon completion of their little gauntlet of non-invasive tests. It's a project of the university. I think they're studying... Ember. The mammoth also collects their trash, mostly shredded paper, though Kate says once they left, half of any machine on the dock. But nobody seems too interested in the lab stop right that night. They stayed aboard and played a card game. I read a book. Let me tell you about it. It takes place in a castle. It's some historic landmark being maintained by a bunch of college kids and aging social misfits. The main characters work in a gift shop. They're co-workers, Mimi and Jen. Mimi is older than Jen, but they seem to be at the same point in their lives. They like their work. They have a playful antagonist relationship with their boss. I actually only read a bit from the middle. Jen reminisces about a cat she'd lost track of. It's a sweet and all complicated passage. Human affection for animals is a good model for pure compassion. In my life's work as the Echo River's premier accident, Antidotalist, I've always found that a carefully excerpted moment is more powerful than any epic history. That's my excuse anyway, for reading books from the inside out. So I stopped there, my eyelids were getting heavy. We were headed back to the lake and a chance to encounter with the Iron Pariah.
anything to be done. Ezra helped keep forage for mushrooms. Let's, oh, I'm picking. Ah, oh, that's interesting. All right, let's see which one I want to go with here. She lit a second cigarette with the embers of the first one. She trembled, sweating a little under a heavy coat. It was warmer near the doors, but she was following directions. No smoking within 25 feet of hospital entrance. As she stood by a hot dog cart, parked at the edge of the sidewalk. Oh wait, you gotta do both. Kate gently rolls a fallen branch and plucks something white from the underside. She holds it up to Ezra to examine. Plesecal peringens, the common name is angel wings. Isn't that pleasant? They have a delicate springy texture and they're tasty, like sweet moss. Would you like to bite? Sweet moss doesn't sound very tasty to me. Personally, I like to be able to tell where my food came from. I flavor along. I like to taste my surroundings, I mean. It keeps me connected to the whole thing. My mushroom hunting mentor told me, it's useless to pretend to know mushrooms. They escape your erindium, er, eruditation? Don't know that one. <laughs> the more you know them, the less sure you feel about identifying them. She taps the cover of the small red book she's carrying. That's why I always bring my favourite guidebook. Kate points to a small mushroom growing in the dirt. Here's an important one to reconsider though. Recognise though. Look, see the sort of greenish pallor of the cap? Amanita phalodes. That's Greek. Amanita means mushroom. And phalodes means, uh, never mind. It smells like honey. Yeah, sort of nauseating though, right? Sickly sweet. Death cap. That's the common name. It killed a lot of people. This little mushroom, including a few Roman emperors. It's uh, revolutionary. <laughs> Even the Buddha died from eating a mushroom when he was very old. That's just what they do. Clear away old things. Make room for new things. Pretty important, right? I've always thought they deserved a little more respect. Would you like to help me look for a few more? I have a sort of shopping list. Great, look for... Actually, just grab any mushroom that catches your eye and throw them in this bag. Let me know when you're done and we'll see what we've got. Have fun. That's the second rule of mushroom hunting. The first rule is ask Kate before eating anything. Okay. Ezra checks out a plastic bag washed up on the island. The bag is ragged and waterlogged. He nudges it with a stick, curling up a plastic thread and spreading it out on the beach. He didn't like to play in the house. It was always too cold. It seemed to store up the cold at night and then slowly discharge it into his bones during the day, while the sun bounced frebly off the mountains. But he liked to play in the woods behind the house. He'd taken a knife from the kitchen, selected but its long serrated edge, meant for slicing bread, its teeth reminded him of a saw blade. He was determined to collect some firewood to heat the house. There was no mushrooms in the bag. Yeah, no shit. Uh, Ezra investigates a rotting stump. The stump is ringed with overlapping shelves of mushrooms, striped brown, blue, grey, white. A caterpillar crawls along one of them. 
He didn't have any friends nearby. None of their neighbors seemed to have children his age. So he played alone in the woods. Alone. Except for the deer. It smells spicy. Sweet. Wild. Like how Ezra had expected his father's tobacco to taste when he hastily chewed and swallowed a noxious fistful and spent the afternoon retching in secret. He heard someone calling his name, probably his mother, but her voice didn't sound right through the trees. He kept going. Ezra tears off a piece of the mushroom and puts it in his bag. Ezra closes his eyes and listens to the water of the distant clicking bats. Okay. Kate kneels in the grass. She parts the grass with her garden knife, studiously combing the ground. The hot dog vendor tries to strike up a conversation with some immediately too personal questions. She decides to give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he considered it part of his job, she thought, to offer his customers some kind of counsel. Maybe it was to salve his guilty conscience for selling junk food outside a hospital. There are no mushrooms in the grass. Kate tries to wipe some mud off her boot. Oh, you got one. See it. Oh my god, they're both going at the same time now. Okay. He tripped on a protruding root and lay for a while in the mud, examining the pale upper branches of a sycamore tree, listening to the soft rumble of a faraway thunderstorm. Then louder, clearer, and his hair stood on the end. And there was the bird. Ezra hands Kate the striped mushroom he took from the tree stump. Great. This is called a turkey tail. Delicious and good for the immune system. You got me beat. I didn't find a thing. So... You have a brother out there somewhere? Julian. He's going to come find me in the morning. After the work is done. Yep, we work pretty hard. We used to spend part of each night looking for my folks. And now we pretty much just work. But maybe that'll change now. Some new friends. Do you have family? I've had a baby once. I got very sick, and the only thing that helped me was a funny looking mushroom called Collared Earth Star. I've basically been on my own since then. Well, that's not really true. Just about everyone who sets foot aboard the Mucky Mama feels like family to me now. I guess if nobody's family, then everybody's family. <laughs> What's this island for? It looks like someone made it on purpose. Oh right, it's kind of a nice simple shape. Pleasantly minimal island geometry. I'm sure it could be natural though. I mean, I don't know if the island itself is map made or not, but I guess I don't know much about this place, really. It's kind of supposed to be some kind of memorial to something. Bill would know more. Sorry, it's a mystery. Ezra kicks the dirt. Months later, she came across a book on homeopathic medicine in a used bookstore and bought it. She thought it was mostly bullshit, but found the author's notes on the unpredictability of mushrooms immediately compelling, spiritual even. She started collecting mushrooms on hikes, never eating them, just collecting, identifying and discarding. Eventually, she connected with the lexicon mythological society and began to co-study in earnest the medicine use of fungi it's a mystery i'll search for clues she put out her cigarette said goodbye to the hot dog vendor and spent the rest of the afternoon listening to doctors trying to understand the world as they did as a list of discreet injuries to be amended Ezra investigates the cypress tree. The tree smells spicy, really. Ezra inspects the bark. A message is carved in the bark. Ozy. Ezra examines a large stone monument. The monument is covered with lichen and painted text. Ezra inspects the lichen. 
colourful outline coats the surface of the monument, mixing with painted graffiti, in some places indistinguishably. Ezra inspects the contents of his pocket. Alright, what have you got? There's some weird colourful moss growing on the stone-faced monument. Ah, that's called lichen. It's actually part fungus. It's sort of weird hybrid. Not really my area of expertise, but some of it is useful medicine properties, and some of it is poison. The usual. <laughs> it's uh, beautiful though, isn't it? What do you think this monument is for? Damn, it's a boat of cats. I thought it was just an eerie noise. That's part weird, but part really cool. I'm not sure anyone remembers. Some big carved Ozzy in that tree over there. Oh, huh. What do you think that means? It's part of someone's name, or it's short for something. Observe Zero Yaks. Old Zebra Yard. Honorary Zoologist Yard. No, what that means. It was a stretch. Well, Ezra, I can't say I know that's what that all adds up to. Like I said, I wish Will were here. He'd have some local history for us. We can ask him, back on the boat. Kate and Ezra look up at the old battleship drifting by. Oh, there it is, the Iron Pariah. Don't worry, it's just passing by. What do you think of it? Uh, is it full of ghosts? Oh, I don't know, probably. I mean, no, no, definitely not. You don't believe in ghosts, do you? No. I've never met a young kid who really believed in ghosts. Lots of older people do, though. I wonder why that is. Somebody told me she got close to it by accident and heard a strange wailing sound. She was a passenger on the mammoth. She said she'd been out fishing on a rowboat and got swept up by the current near the clustered place. Before she knew it, the iron pariah was up upon her. Unimaginably massive up close, but eerily silent. The only sound, she said, was the lapping of the lake water against the iron hull, and a faint sort of, well, she said, chorus of muse. I'd be damned if I know that. what well, that sounds like. Uh, I've never gotten close enough to the ship myself. I've heard it was in the Civil War. I guess I had boats full of soldiers and supplies going up and down the Ohio River. And they fought on the river, like, boat to boat, with cannons or something? I guess machine guns? I'm no uh, military historian, as you can probably tell. Anyway, I guess this one just got lost, and somehow ended up all the way down here. Maybe it slipped into a cave up north. They're all connected, underground. There's another version of the story where it didn't get lost. It was full of deserters. They came down here to hide. Maybe that's why it's called a pariah. More mysteries, they do pile up over time, as people forget the details. Thanks for taking me mushroom picking. Mushroom hunting. You can pick apples because they're right out there in the open. Mushrooms hide, you have to hunt for them. Ezra's parents shook him awake. They seemed alarmed, but not immediately concerned. They led him back to the house, past the house, to the car. Dad said they were going to stay at the bus station for a while. The one with the little arcade. With the car game he liked. Dad watched him closely in the rear view mirror. Expecting Ezra to be excited or confused or scared. But he didn't feel anything. He hardly seemed to hear. In fact he felt like he was observing the family car from a distance. From far above. From the clouds. It's time to go.